Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. My guest today is Samuel Moyne, who is the Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and a Professor of History at Yale University. He has written several books in his fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, including The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, and he has edited or co-edited a number of others. His most recent books are Christian Human Rights, based on Mellon Distinguished Lectures at the University of Pennsylvania in fall of 2014, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. His newest book, published in September this year, is titled Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and reinvented war, and will be the focus of our conversation today. Over the years, Samuel has written in venues such as the Boston Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Dissent, The Nation, The New Republic, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. I recently finished his latest book, Humane, and to say that it was a perspective-altering read would be a huge understatement. It is a deeply insightful and undoubtedly controversial book, and I hope it does get the attention that it deserves. For that very reason, I'm truly humbled to have Sam on the show. Sam, thank you for joining me on The Voices of War. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege to join you. Fantastic. And before we get into the book and its thesis, maybe we can start with your own background a little bit. How did you come to be interested in uh, human rights in the first place and then uh, perhaps war uh, uh, secondary as well? What drove you into the field? Well, I was a young man in in the 1990s uh, at what we thought of as the end of history, and um, human rights were kind of enjoying their apogee, Mm. and students like me were presented with them as the basic principles of the future of global governance, Uh, and I still think they're very important. Um, I took the laws of war in law school because it seemed like the residual problem after the end of communism was that there were these outposts of barbarity like southeastern europe or rwanda where it was very important to enforce norms against atrocity to keep it from happening including through military intervention if possible or to punish uh the perpetrators of it if not Mm. uh and i i think you know, I I realized later that a lot of that turned out to be very kind of paradoxical because we didn't realize after 2001 that a, a new age of American war was coming and, and the priorities of the 1990s um, affected that that era that those 20 years so far of war on terror in ways that i began to find Mm. worrisome and so Mm. i wrote a book about it yeah and and what a fantastic read and i find uh it interesting that you mentioned the barbaric uh region of uh southeastern europe and or or the western balkans which uh, is of course where i hail from so uh, i was particularly interested to read uh, certain segments of the book because it re- resonated very closely to my own experience or the experience of my um, countrymen and women and, and certainly my family. Um, did you have an academic background in your family or any kind of disinterest into into war or or, or Not ethics? at all. I mean, no. my grandfather was in the army and in World War II, but served in in the United States. Mm-hmm. My father was in the Air Force and. Uh, in the era of the Vietnam War, but didn't didn't go there, right? Um, and so I've had all family members in in the U.S. military. My own personal background it was involvement um, in um, U.S. foreign policy, working in the White House during the Kosovo uh, intervention. Oh, right. Uh, and so I I mentioned you know, barbarism, because that's how the the Serbs were presented to us Mm. um, by authors like Robert Kaplan and others who kind of suggested that Southeast Europe was a place where we just needed to civilize Mm. um, because ancient ethnic hatreds were 
were becoming kind of unmasterable after after communism departed. So um, that was my own personal experience in as an actor, but otherwise I've just been, you know, reading and writing books for life. What a, what a lovely narrative uh, to to embrace, I guess. Uh, you know, let let's go and civilize uh, these uncivilized hordes, <laughs> which uh, seems to be a narrative that's very easily embraced. And I think it's uh, I think it, it's the paradox of that narrative is very well weaved in into your book. Uh, maybe we'll touch on that Kosovo uh, piece again because I think it does actually feature uh, in the book. In an, it's Correct. an important uh, point uh, in in how we've kind of shifted our relationship to war. Uh, but maybe uh, we can start off with uh, kind of a broad, overarching understanding of what what is the book about and what it's what is its main thesis. Well, the book is about different ways that um, international law has been used to constrain war um, since about the middle of the 19th century. And as I especially focus on a kind of distinction between two ways you might go. One is keeping it from starting or stopping it once it starts mm. um, on the one hand and um, reducing suffering in it once it begins or if you can't stop it on the other. And I try to study how the first agenda, stopping war, had the upper hand for a long time, um, but it was succeeded by an almost exclusive um, interest in the second agenda, making war humane. Mm. And I worry that that's come with a, a, a cost. Um, not that you know less brutal war is bad; it's good, but that it's one of those good things that could have some bad things with it. And I think in, in particular, I focus on the risk that hu relatively more humane wars are easier to perpetuate, like the American war on terror has been. Mm, yeah, which is, again, something in my own experience that um, having served in, in, in a couple of operation theaters uh, in this global war on terror, uh, I can certainly relate to the simplicity of it—it uh, is—it's—it's—it's—it's uh, it's, it's, it's game-like in many ways for those who aren't on the front lines, you know, kicking doors in. Um, it, right. it, it's all very—it's all very distant. Uh, but I do like the, the how you phrase that because when I was writing my notes, I literally drew a junction uh, of you know there was there was a split between right. this and and, and I, I'm even reluctant to use the term pacifist or pacifism because there it is it is now culturally imbued with such negativity and naivety and you know right. this this kind of how oh, you poor little pacifist over there the world is not that uh, that kind uh, but that's the split it went to pacifism and then it went to this well war is inevitable so therefore let's make war nice and neat and clean and surgical and precise um so w what is in your and 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 i note that you actually use leo tolstoy quite a lot in your book i think you open up uh deeply with a, with a deep understanding of uh, Tolstoy's background, which for me was actually very new, uh, but you kind of bookended as well. Maybe that's a, that's a question to ask. Why Leo Tolstoy in particular, and how does he relate to this junction uh, that we're talking about? Well, so first, I, I really appreciate your, your kind of anxiety about pacifism, because many of us have been raised to think of it as, you know, ex extreme or marginal, which it is. Um, and I, I make a distinction in, in the book between, you know, kind of an anti-war position and a mm -hmm. pacifist position, which mm. says that war is never justified or legal. Um, if you take an anti-war view, you might say, well, if it turns out that most of the wars that break out um, are bad, they make the world worse, then it doesn't mean that there can never be mm -hmm. a justified or legal war, but it does mean that there's this, there's this, you know, strong possibility that wars, um, turn out differently than you think. Mm -hmm. Um, they last longer, they get out of hand, um, they become self-perpetuating. And yeah. what I try to do is, is it, it, if 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 I can use an American phrase, kind of give some love to anti-war impulses, which mm -hmm. 
um, have changed the world and actually led to a reduction in, in, in some forms of international war before our time. And we can't really make sense of um, you know, modern history without mm. considering how much people focused on the constraint of war itself rather than just the constraint of how it's fought. Mm-hmm. Tolstoy was a pacifist eventually, um, but I focus on him not for that reason, but because I think he developed the best anti-war criticism of making war humane. Mm-hmm. Um, he basically argued um, after participating in wars himself as an officer like the Crimean War that um, we we should worry about the risk of perpetuation of war in the attempt to reduce suffering in it. And he developed some really, you know, I think sh- kind of hard hitting um, suggestions in the course of building his case. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he compared um, making war humane to making slavery humane, yeah. which had been popular in, in the early 19th century. Um, and Tolstoy said, well, that, that involves an unacceptable compromise with slavers, which mm. may entrench this evil um, when it's important to get rid of it. Mm. And mm. then he compared making war humane with the humanization of non-human animal slaughter and said, look at all the people who think they're good because they're eating humanely slaughtered meat. Mm. Now he, as a not just a pacifist, but a vegetarian, assumed that meat eating is 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 vicious Mm. and if you take that view you start to worry that humanization kind of fools meat eaters into Mm -hmm. thinking they're better than they are and analogously tolstoy worried that those who you know say that humane war is 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 in a sense makes us good people um if we choose to fight it um could, could be people who fight wars mm. that are evil and fool themselves into thinking they're not. Yeah. Well, this is the, the, the kind of uh, the idea that the path to, to hell is paved with good intentions, right? It's, it's very much speaks to that point. Yeah. Exactly. His analogy with humane slaughter is really supposed to identify kind of bad faith. Not, not, it's not just that there are unexpected outcomes, but mm-hmm. that we're, we're kind of deluding ourselves and we're, we, we, we're trying to get out of something we know is wrong by saying, well, we've made it a little kinder and gentler. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but both points are really important because of course we have entered so many wars that have, have, involved unintended consequences but we've also kind of supported wars we probably suspect um aren't worthwhile and are doing more harm than good and and you know listen to politicians say well at least we're not torturing anymore or at least we're keeping civilian casualties to a minimum in the course of it and that's it's that latter thing that Mm. tolstoy is concerned about it's almost as though a you know it, it, it speaks to me as though you know it's a drug addiction or you know uh, as a former recovering right. smoker i used to well at least i'm i'm just having one cigarette a day now you know that's okay or at least right. I'm, I'm at least i'm outside i'm not harming anyone else so exactly. it feels as though there's but it's a, on a much bigger obviously scale but that's our exactly. attachment to 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 war yeah i think that's right you know deals what you make with yourself are are really central to you know you know staying on the wrong you know path and, and I think Tolstoy kind of developed a version of that mm. worry and focusing not just on any deal, but on the deal that, well, if we've made something that's brutal, more humane, it must be, you know, more tolerable mm. when it is. And that's the problem. Yeah. That, yeah. It's because there's a lot of truth in it. I mean, it, it's resolving our own cognitive Correct. dissonance with the fact Correct. that we're, you know, killing other human beings who are just like Correct. us when we peel back. In every other way, uh, but because we're, we're justifying it through, and of course, just for theory and, and and international law, which we'll cover, uh, uh, that that's our antidote to to soothing our 
you know, moral crisis or the crisis of the conscience of our conscience. Um, but we, so you, you, you again, uh, in, in, I mean, the book is there, there are so many threads in the book. I mean, one could never unpack an entire book in a podcast, but you, you do make the case and, and starting with Tolstoy, uh, that we, we were going down a path of making war illegal and we were, there was quite a lot of traction. Uh, why, why did we sway off that path? What happened? Well, so I I follow the emphasis on Tolstoy by looking at a lot of kind of peace activists across the Atlantic um, who tended to be women, mm. and I focus in particular on an Austrian noblewoman who won the 1905 Nobel Peace Prize, who was one of the most you know iconic peace leaders and and probably for a bit the most famous woman in in the world in the early 20th century and. Um, I, I focus on how such peace advocates who were not pacifists necessarily, mm. they just were had an anti-war movement, um, demanded that states get along better and take the the choice to go to war with each other off the table. And mm. they fail badly in the short term. You know, World War One comes, World War Two comes, but they ultimately succeed in and, and yet it comes at a price. So they succeed because they change international law. And we have something called the United Nations Charter in 1945, which is supposed to prohibit war, except, you know, when there's self-defense is at stake or when the Security Council authorizes it. Um, and yet it required the United States uh, to uh, agree to rule the world. Mm. Um, and that meant that while the United States had fought lots of wars um, before, it began to fight wars in lots of new places after 1945. And so kind of there was a European peace, mm -hmm. but America began fighting global wars of the kind that European empires had been fighting for centuries. And um you know, one one way of looking at why the imperative shifted is that first, people thought that was the best that could be done. Um, and it's true that after 1945, the incidence, um, the, the regularity of international war declines. Uh, or people also associated peace with the Soviet Union. Since the Soviet Union was doing lots of bad things, um, including its own intervention in Afghanistan years mm -hmm. before America's after 9-11, but um, because it was weaker in the Cold War, the Soviet Union presented itself as a peace power. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only fair to note the United States engaged in like lots and lots and lots of interventions. Uh, through the years after 1945 during the Cold War. So, you know, but, but people were nervous um, to pursue the peace agenda because it seems seemed like it was pink mm, uh, or yeah. red. Yeah. Um, and so that was the second reason. Um, and I, I, I think there was a last reason, which is that after 1989, in, in a unilateral world with one superpower, it began to seem like war was a good thing. Like we needed the United mm. States to fight not fewer, but more wars. And mm. actually the country intervened more often than during the Cold War. And that's partly because people concluded that in the case of Southeastern Europe or in the case, mischance of Rwanda or in the case of Kosovo, um, it was important to have war for a good cause. So mm. for all of these reasons, the, the focus was taken off, you know, constraining the use of force. Um, and maybe it, it migrated to this other agenda, which had taken a backseat for so long, making mm. the remaining wars less brutal than they had been. Yeah. And, and it strikes me as though there's a deeply infused in this narrative is morality it is it is moral it is we have a responsibility to stand up and 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 again as somebody who's born and raised in bosnia in sarajevo you know who lived 
for several months under sniper fire. Shelling got out with, you know, one of the last UN convoys. Uh, you know, my father was in the front lines for three and a half years. Uh, and, and he's the first one to say, you know, thank God the US came and bombed the Serb positions around Sarajevo. Right? So it's very easy. In fact, I might make this a question. I mean, what, what do you say to those people? Um, well, even people like myself who, who would argue that, you know, the right to, you know, protect is a legitimate claim, uh, you know, certainly post 1989, uh, you know, after the, uh, you know, at, at, at the end of history, so to speak, uh, when right. the US did seemingly right. rescue uh, uh, nations like Bosnia. Right. Well, no, I mean, I, as, as someone who's anti war but not pacifist, I want to leave room for good wars and, and hopefully legal ones. Mm. And in, in that case, um, NATO had the authorization of the United Nations. Mm-hmm. Um, to kind of go out to um, stop bad actors. Mm. Uh, and um, it, it, I think the trouble is that it was paving the way for something that w- ended up not being as worthwhile. Mm. And just to start, start, you know, remember Kosovo, mm. that was a NATO action that was not authorized by the United Nations. And a lot of us said it didn't matter because it was a morally just cause and who else was going to do it. Hmm. Um, and, and that's the slippery, slippery it, slope that you refer to. That's a right? slippery slope because what happened not four years later? Well, George W. Bush disregarded international law and I- I- invaded Iraq. And, hmm. and w- 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 now the death count is from just that part is, you know, more than 500,000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so even if you say, well, these wars are in a good cause, what about the, you know, the abuse um, of pretext that good wars allow? And what about um, the, you know, the, the precedents they set and above all what about the unintended consequences as you Mm. mentioned so Mm. i'm not against wars if they're Mm. just but you know part of the question of whether they're just is what what are what are what are all the kind of results that you're you're teeing up um for for a future and once we begin to see that more war in the international system is is generally for the worse we really have to be very stingy and make sure that we're not you know allowing you know a- allowing you know too much violence that mm. is going to set us back collectively which i think american war has on mm. balance in mm. in our lifetimes and that's the can that's the difficult predicament here is the fact that to make it just again it implies it's moral there's you mean uh, that we need to do it uh, but then when you start doing some mental gymnastics through your lawyers that shapes justice right. and morals into interests right. right that's when we start deviating i guess from the intent behind what we tried to do after world war 2 uh, right. But then, of course, we had Korea, uh, Vietnam. In fact, you 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 name one of your uh, one of your chapters as the Vietnamese pivot, uh, which which again is a, a, a really insightful because Vietnam did something uh, very new, right, to how we view not only the justice of war but then the conduct of war. This is where we introduce right. very different dimensions of importance that is how we fight wars which shifted right. the 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 i guess the discussion it's no longer about is the war itself just but is it are we fighting it justly can exactly. you maybe elaborate on that a little bit sure so you know in fairness the agenda of making war humane goes back to tolstoy's time and mm-hmm. he actually has one of his characters criticize it because mm. the first geneva convention which is is created by these Swiss do-gooders in 1864 is about taking care of wounded soldiers on the Mm. battlefield. But generally, like the rules about how to fight war are brutal for a very long time. And especially when it comes to like European colonialism, Mm. which basically often excludes, you know, um, like 
colonial subjects or non-Christians, non-white from coverage by the rules. And anyway, those rules are like sort of just set aside Mm. when, you know, conflict is really um, nasty, like in World War I, World War II. Um, So something has to happen to like make the, the humane war, you know, something, you know, that that isn't just some some writing on paper, but it's actually affecting the conduct of war. And I argue that Vietnam is that is mm-hmm. that big transformative event. Um, mm-hmm. You go back and and think about Korea. Um, you know, first big war after 1945 and the UN Charter. And actually, at the beginning, mm-hmm. um, the United States says, "No, it's it's North Korea that violated the UN Charter," and it gets a UN resolution to to kind of protect South Korea, which it does. The trouble is that Douglas MacArthur uh, then decides to push up into the north. And, you know, it's a three-year war that follows because the Chinese then intervene. And it's one of the most, like, brutal wars in history, probably by some measures the, Mm -hmm. the worst war in the 20th century. But, you know, Americans don't really care that much. Um, there, there isn't a kind of crisis of conscience around Korea. Things change and in exi- Vietnam. And no, no existential threat, right? Like the few years before, yeah. Ex- well, of course, that that's for sure. Um, you know, and 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 yet, because of Cold War imperatives, it's it's still deemed really important mm-hmm. to kind of secure freedom in South Korea, or even see if if the whole Korean Peninsula could be unified. It's just that MacArthur didn't you know, bet on uh, Mao sending, you know, thousands of Chinese troops that just won a a revolution Mm. across, across the, the Yalu river. And, you know, it, it, it became a, a, you know, it just an atrocious event with, you know, peasants and with, uh, you know, U S soldiers fleeing South and Mm. then a kind of war position that was, is just horrendous. Um, Mm. Vietnam begins and it's not like people care that much about the brutality that is going on in a very lopsided um, war with, you know, the same kind of aerial bombardment that had been, you know, used in the Pacific in World War II and in Korea. Um, And the terms of debate around the war in the early years after 1965, when America escalates it, it, are basically, should we do have the war? Mm. Is it illegal to have the war, just like the UN Charter would suggest you do? But then, um, you know, My Lai comes, the My Lai massacre, and a lot of people kind of seize on it and say, um, "What proves what what proves like that American aggression is terrible is that it leads to atrocity of the kind that." the notorious photos of the women and children shot in the village kind of dramatized. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet they succeed by dramatizing atrocity and in, in kind of making the war so unpopular, even more unpopular that it ends. Uh, Richard Nixon, you know, does some bad things at the end of the war, you know, the Christmas bombing, the, Cambodian bombings, but but basically is is forced to end it. Um, and it's in the aftermath of that that the kind of anti-war cause begins to die. Mm. Um, and instead, a, a, a few different actors begin to say, no, what's really important is making war less brutal. Mm. One group is the new states of the global south. You know, they've been treated to bl- brutal war for centuries at European hands chiefly. And Mm. they say, well, let's have better rules. Mm. And so it's only in the 1970s that the international law finally says you can't shoot at a combat, a civilian. And it says that even if you're shooting at a combat, you can't kill too many civilians along the way. Mm. And Europeans are done with their empire. So they're on board. The interesting case is the Americans after Vietnam, because even in the military, um, they recognize they've taken a, a terrible public relations hit, uh, and they want to change the warrior's honor to be 
different so that it's not about, you know, that kind of event that Milai revealed. And so they they sign on to to the to the the laws of war, which are now branded international humanitarian law. Mm. And yeah. so you have this kind of convergence after Vietnam to focus on making war humane. Yeah. It's 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 incredible. I mean, and echoes of that, uh, uh, you know, this almost focus on the conduct of, as opposed to the war itself, uh, it is echoing even in Australia at the moment. We've got some soldiers who are in some hot water over potential war crimes uh, conducted in Afghanistan, and certainly not the only army in the world that's facing uh, these questions. And they they should be questioned. I have no, there's no dispute about that. Uh, but it just removes the bigger piece of the puzzle off the table uh, because we're focusing on the micro on the couple of soldiers as opposed to those who've actually sent us to war and whether they had met the very laws or the very uh, principles of, you know, our much loved just war theory themselves. Uh, and this is where we start talking about the kind of, you know, last resort. It's fallen off. You know, that's the war is the last resort. Yes, this is the last resort. Why? Because it is the resort that will get us the most quick, if, you know, effect uh, on the battlefield uh, that we want, which I find right. absolutely fascinating. There was one other interesting piece that I've, I've discussed elsewhere, but I just want to uh, pick out here about Vietnam. And and you write in there that Vietnam stopped conscription. That's where we we saw the end uh, of this kind of large scale. Hey, you're going to war. Uh, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by this point because I think there's so much in it. Uh, but wh why do you think that's an important piece and why, you know, this shift to professional or voluntary armies or all volunteer armies has played a role? Well, so it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating debate that takes place because some people at the time think that if you eliminate conscription, you'll make it more difficult for politicians to go to war because they won't have the forces to do so. Whereas others warn that, no, it's the opposite. That when, when you have volunteers uh, staffing the military services, you won't need popular consent because, you're, or it'll be easier to sustain it because uh, nobody's, you know, sons and husbands and brothers and increasingly women um, it are, are going to be threatened unless they've chosen that life. Um, and it, and it, therein it, lies it, the it thing, is, if they've chosen it, right? That's the, of that's, course. That's, now, yeah, yeah. In, in America, I mean, I don't want to generalize. It turns out that we have a very inadequate welfare state and a lot of the poorest Americans who are often, um, you know, African Americans mm -hmm. join the military because it's like, it's an incredible chance to get benefits and get uh, a salary and get trained to earn the salary um, and, and so forth. Um, I think that though there's kind of an irony here because ultimately in the book, what I, what I try to show is that American war evolved beyond using troops. And so it's not mm -hmm. like we can say that the new form of the war on terror that we'll end up talking about kind of was, was dependent on, on troops, whether they were conscripts or volunteers. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. really interesting that there was a big debate about w what it would mean for the perpetuation of American war that um, conscription became so unpopular and it mm. was replaced by an all-volunteer force in the early 1970s. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I explain it in my head, it, it removed the war from our lounge rooms and our discussions right. and the sorrow in the lounge room because I knew right. that my father, my brother, my mother, my sister had died. It moved it onto right. the TV screen, which is, Absolutely. For, for one, it's entertainment, and B, yeah. it's, there's, there's, yeah. there's an emotional disconnect. If there is a, a core of professional professionals, to call them that, who've put their hand up. And again, you know, this is a question where, you know, did they really choose or was it the only option available? That's a, that's a different debate. Um, but, you know, a core of these who have chosen to go and fight our wars, let's wrap them up into, you know, these glorified notions of, you know, fighting for our freedom, fighting for, you know, uh, uh, morally just wars, which is a wonderful narrative, right? It's a beautiful, it's, it's one as a citizen who, chooses to sit back here in the comfort of my own home it's a wonderful narrative to 
get behind to, hey, show your patriotism, show your love of country, you know, do part of your duty. If you're not going to go and fight the war, at least support the warriors who are fighting the war, which I think is, uh, uh, I think in, we, as a society, we probably need to talk about that um, uh, a lot more. Um, we don't need to delve into every conflict, but I think it is, uh, uh, and again, I, I invite my listeners to read your book. It's a, it, it really is a fascinating read. I've really, really enjoyed it because you, what I love about talking to historians and reading history books is that, again, you're weaving in a narrative, but you're linking so many different points of history and, and, and telling us how they relate to each other because nothing happens in isolation. Right. But we then kind of go down the path and – uh, we find ourselves in a post 9-11 world, uh, which I think is uh, really where we see the, this war coming into its own uh, right. and where we're removing. So we've now desensitized the population, broadly speaking, to war. Uh, we have a professional warrior class that's going to fight our wars. For us sitting back as civilians, uh, off they go to fight for our freedoms. You know, this is now where you start, like you said, we start removing the need for even the soldiers themselves, but we're, we're, we're bringing the wedge down into, uh, you know, firstly our special forces and then drones and so on. But uh, maybe I'll let you tell the story because I think this is really, really pivotal uh, of what happens sure. after 9-11. Sure. So, I mean, in some ways, it's, it's the comparison between Vietnam and the war on terror suggests that, like, even more people, maybe in near unanimity, after September 11th were, were for some kind of military response. Um, but interestingly, I think it, it, it support eroded more quickly in the, the era of 9-11. What interested me is what the consequences were. So if you compare the period of me lying after, you have atrocity kind of adding fuel to the fire that the anti-war movement has created. But after 9-11, the reverse happened. Um, there, there, there was a comparable atrocity story around the Abu Ghraib prison mm -hmm. and sickening images, just as at My Lai. And actually, the same reporter, now much older, named Seymour Hirsch, played a role in both, both revelations. But... The years after 2004, um, when the Iraq war had gone south and the occupation was so difficult and the Abu Ghraib story kind of helped delegitimate mm. that war, um, uh, went in a different direction. The war on terror didn't end. Instead, if you like, atrocity was removed from the equation. Mm. Um, and it, it, it turned out that... Um, brutality could be like a bug in a program and it was it was it was it was mm. removed and the result was kind of ongoing counterterrorist war mm. and so i focus especially on the role of lawyers and kind yeah. of changing the original war on terror which was big and brutal um to the second and new form of the war on terror which was using special forces and armed drones rather than big troop deployments and was advertised publicly by politicians um, as now adhering to the, the, the laws of war and the constraints that are supposed to rule out brutality. And I think a lot of Americans um, kind of bought it. And so it's, it's quite fascinating that you know, we we do think of making war humane as a good thing, and it is, if mm. the alternative mm -hmm. is brutal war. But I think it turned out after 9-11, in the story I tell, that if the even better thing is not having a war that's not worth fighting, making more war humane could have its own evil associated mm. with it because it perpetuates the war or helps legitimate the war. And, you know, the central character I try to dramatize is, is the president after George W. Bush, Barack Obama, who really talks in public about these moral dilemmas and tries to shape a view of the war on terror as now humane. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to bring that up because I think he's a 
prime example who publicly had thought bubbles. He was wrestling publicly with his own conscience. Right. Uh, and and in some way, I'm, I'm sure he's truly convinced that he's doing the right thing. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that, and we can hear what you think, I find it hard to believe that this is motivated by sinister internal kind of monologues of, you know, crushing and 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 deleting entire populations or or that it's somehow fueled by evil internally uh i again i think this is more a path to hell is paved with good intentions right because you as an as, a, as an individual actor say a u.s president as an individual actor you only have a lifespan of 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 agency in that office that is limited and you know i'm sure deep down all of them are fueled by good intentions somewhere, regardless of how externally they might be perceived. Right. I think that's, that, that's, that's why I focused in the way I did in the book, because of course you can say, no, America's a war machine and there's the military industrial complex and politicians always want to fight. Um, and it's only fair to say that Obama had a lot of considerations. Like he understood that Bush's popularity had tanked because the war was brutal and a lot of Americans died. Mm. And Obama's biggest, you know, need was to immunize American soldiers from harm, mm. which the turn to the new form of the war on terror, special forces and especially armed drones or standoff missiles did mm. because, mm. you know, it's it's it, that these this new form of war is much safer for Americans. Yeah. Doesn't require kind of an occupation force that's subject to roadside bombs and other kinds of attacks. But when he talked in public about um, the new regime of targeted killings that he normalized, he he didn't talk about Americans and the mm. the, the safety of of our troops. Um, although that was surely part of it and, you know, the military industrial complex too. Instead, as you say, he wrestled with it. And what I think is the most amazing speech occurs not um, in 2009 when he receives the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> and cites yeah. these Swiss um, gentlemen back in the 19th century who had in, who'd had the idea of humane war. But four years later, when he rolls out the drone program and says, you know, we shouldn't remain at endless war. You know, war like this degrades countries. And, you know, a lot of us think he called, you know, uh, the coming of Donald Trump mm. um, at that time. But but then he said, look, you know, the alternative is brutal war and I have to fight terrorists. So you should thank me for, you know, banning torture, for minimizing civilian casualties and making the war humane. And mm. amazingly, he he kind of was heckled by an anti-war activist mm. at this speech, which is at the National Defense University in 2013. And, you know, she got taken out of the room, but he kind of continued reflecting off script on like the whole ethics of the thing. So yeah. I agree with you that no matter the big powerful forces that affected him, he was still a moral, you know, reasoner. And he wanted to think morally about his political choices um and that's why i wrote the book because he he himself stressed the moral significance of humanizing war mm. again it's a, it, it, these are such nuanced points that i really really do hope that your book goes far and wide and that you know students and uh practitioners of war actually talk about these issues uh, because I, I I don't think in and certainly in the, in the Australian army as, as uh, you know we're, we're starting to talk about the ethics of war from a slightly different angle uh, but right. I think we're still not zooming out of the macro um, you know right. how do we get to where we are uh, and you know and, and again I see this as kind of various branches you know we branched off uh, at some point from anti-war uh, you know then we branched off into you know different forms of uh, uh, just war and then different forms of humane war, uh, and, and we're continuously arguing for progress along this branch. We, you know, it feels to me like we need to step back a whole bunch of branches and go, hold on, how do we end up down that far? Uh, you know, what did we skip here? Now, and one point that really did stand out, especially because I've spoken to a couple of my guests about this in the past, uh, is 
uh, the absence or reduction of diplomacy, and I, again, it's a, it's a really nuanced point you make, is that humane war has in many ways, if not replaced, and certainly pushed aside the need for diplomacy. Why, why was that? Well, so I agree with you totally that, you know, making war humane is really important and it's, um, and yet it's not the only question, you know, it's not even the main question, which is, should we have the war Hmm. no matter how brutal or humane? And, you know, I think there's a parable in the life of a soldier who just died, an American, Colin Powell, who, Hmm. Hmm. you know, was the prince of the post-Vietnam officer corps. Hmm. And, you know, his claim to fame for a long time was that he, he said, we will not repeat Vietnam. Now, he didn't mean so much the brutality as letting the military get sucked into a quagmire and an mm. endless war. And yet, what did he do? Mm. Mm. He ended up, you know, justifying the Iraq war and, uh, before the United Nations and supporting it. Yeah. And it was the worst thing that ever happened to the U.S. military in recent times. So, you know, even in the military or especially in the military, everything's at stake in whether the war is just and necessary mm. and not so much or only whether it's, you know, humane enough. And um, I think, you know, people of goodwill really can coalesce around more attention on this basic question and it matters for australians because you know you're in the five eyes and you know you're part of a global security agenda that americans are are leading um and uh, australians are frequently involved um i mean australians were involved in yeah i think we've been to every war with the u.s i think we're the only country that has you know the role of australians in the vietnam Mm. war is little studied but is really important Mm. Mm. um so you, you, you know, I think that um, my principal argument is sort of, it's not that we shouldn't struggle to have war more humane, but only once we've made absolutely sure it ought to be fought. So mm. you come to diplomacy and, um, you know, there's not a broad public discussion around what would be the, the um, conditions under which you could not have a war on terror anymore. Mm. And sadly, it was left to Trump to do things like tweet out this hashtag, you know, end endless war and to make a deal with the Taliban to get America out of that quagmire and so forth. And Mm. that's just a failure on the part of the kind of elites of the country to Mm -hmm. let this thing drag on so far um, that it fell to Trump, you know, someone way outside the mainstream to kind of claim the anti-war tradition, which is just sad. Mm, And mm. it represents, I think, a shame, a shameful chapter. And of course he was shameful, but he, he capitalized on a, on a kind of mistaken omission in Mm. the years that led up to him. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you make the point, you know, it's the the mainstream, right? The mainstream or you know, as he then later called it, the swamp and so on. Uh, Right. I mean, to his credit, which I can't even believe I'm saying, but he called it and he saw it as it is. I mean, it's a there Correct. is that the world has been the world, and I'm talking the US and this, uh, broadly the West has been disappointed by its leaders because you know it's been lie and lie and lie and lie after lie, uh, and our endless wars. And uh, when I say our, I mean Australian as well. I mean this has been Australia's Australia's longest war as well, uh, and we've been you know alongside the whole way. Despite the rhetoric of we don't negotiate with terrorists, uh, correct? We're doing the very thing right now. Mm. Absolutely, and you know I think we're all, in spite of the chaos and disorder and the withdrawal from Afghanistan, it was a good thing to mm. negotiate an exit. And mm. you know you can say the Taliban is a terrorist group and so forth, um, but in fact, it 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 ruled the country even mm. before there was a choice to withdraw. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just, a, it's, it, it, I even would say, you know, the intervention in 2001 in Afghanistan, which people were tolerant about given mm. what had happened mm. on 9 11 in lower Manhattan. Um, you know, if it ends up putting the same people back in power that you ejected, it was a mistake. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. If it ends up leading to hundreds of thousands of deaths locally, and setting the country back as all the kind of economic studies show, not to mention trillions of dollars of Australian and American 
money to fund the thing, mm, you know, mm. it was a waste. Mm. And that's why we should just have a lot more care and caution uh, before war starts and yeah. not just focus on how it's conducted, which has been the premier topic of, you know, discussion around mm. the war on terror for 20 years. I mean, the, the, you bring up, a, you remind me of an interesting point, uh, again, from the book, and that's, you know, the change of 9-11 was not, not merely the, the, okay, we're going to go and target terrorists uh, and removal of their protection. Uh, you know, consciously, I think you, 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 you provide a lot of insight from John Yu, uh, Yu's writing, which I've subsequently, I mean, this is going back. I mean, so much has happened that I, I didn't have a recollection of that in any way. Uh, so I went back and read the memo that has now been declassified. It, it's incredible. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. But also there was the expanding ring of culpability that you talk about, right? So, you know, this idea of associated forces. So therefore, if we've, we've swallowed the pill of, we do not negotiate with terrorists. We and we give ourselves the absolute right, moral right, to treat them how we see fit, under the idea that you know, hey, it's to save our own lives or to prevent f- future attacks. Which, okay, to an extent, I can understand the argument. I don't agree with it uh, because it makes us as bad as those that we're seeking to prosecute. But it doesn't just do that. It does that to anybody now who we describe as an associated force, which of course was the right. Taliban, which of course was, you know, as we go from there to uh, a myriad of other forces, if, if we can call them that. Uh, but it really expanded our target list for one, but it reduced the list of those who we can actually talk to. So anybody right. who we tarnish with the brush of terrorism, well, we don't talk to them. Um, right. and, and, you know, if you've made that brush bigger and thicker then you've you know you, th- this is again you know i think you make that point it really reduces our ability to negotiate and and, and have uh diplomacy um right. sorry did you want did you want to add no no i mean i i agree with all that and i focus on kind of the insidious role of lawyers since mm. um you know john Yu was you know widely you know castigated for his sloppy legal work and authorizing various wars and um, authorizing torture for that matter. But then you get to late, the later lawyers and they are the ones who, you know, never find a war for which they're not willing to give the U S president a permission slip under, Mm. you know, domestic law or international law. And then they kind of compensate by saying, well, but, but we're the custodians of the humanity of the war because we're, unlike John Yu, forcing the war to be fought yeah. with, without torture and with a minimum of civilian casualties. But that's the self-delusion you know, delusion that yeah. we started talking about. And we need to stop listening to the lawyers and reserve the right to ask, well, wait, should we have the war? Is it good enough that it's humane? Um mm. And are there other views that we ought to consider about, like, what, w- you know, whether it, it's legal in the first place? Because, mm. of course, a president is always going to think that what he wants to do is legal. Um, but the rest well, of the us lawyers will make reserve, it so, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, it, you know, there's no judge to contradict them. Only the people can and only the international community can. So I think if there were more emphasis on like the rules that are supposed to stop wars from starting, hmm. you know, in the heat of the moment, uh, then I think we'd all be better off and yeah. not let the lawyers, you know, take charge of because what that means is more war, even if it's more humane. Yeah, and that's an that's a hugely important point, and, and and it's really relevant for Australia that I don't think I certainly touched on it in the podcast previously, but I don't think in our social discourse it's something that's discussed a lot. But for example, the Iraq War, it is Australia went to Iraq with the US, and now it's openly discussed by some of our senior leaders, uh, military and otherwise, and our prominent political thinkers. We went there for the alliance. It's it's an, it's open. It's open knowledge. It's not even. It's not a classified, in any right. sense, uh, discussion. It is completely transparently uh, presented as we went because it's in our interest to keep our alliance with the US. Full stop. Now, you have to ask the question, at, at which point do we, do we hold our leaders who sent our men and women to war with complete impunity against, right. again, this is the point, against the very 
principles we so love the just law theory so again last resort necessity proportionality all of these things Absolutely. that fit under the jus ad bellum uh, right. you know domain whilst we hold our soldiers to the jus in bello domain of the conduct of war so it's a, it, again i think this is this is why this debate and this discussion needs to be elevated to much higher levels and it needs to become more I hate to use the term, but mainstream. <laughs> as I completely much as agree with you. And, you yeah. know, it, it was a noble thing for my country to save yours during World War II, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you just outsource your, you know, diplomacy and 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 legal determination of whether the wars you you join us in fighting mm. um, are just and, and legal to to our lawyers mm. Um, mm. or our politicians, for that matter. So I think you know some greater policy autonomy yeah. uh, in, in Australia would make a lot of sense to me. And a decoupling from values and interests um, because we, right. you know, th th those two have now become aligned where we're, we're selling the idea that we're to our domestic audiences who we of course need to keep uh, satisfied is that we're doing the right thing by going to this war against the, you know, weapons of mass destruction. But really it's, that's just a, a, a nice pill to swallow that we're doing the right thing and morally right thing, which is the values piece, which is what we so much promote in the global arena. But really, it's for our interests, uh, an interest being, you know, our alliance with the US, which is we need to decouple those two again and actually make a clear distinction um, uh, of, you know, one against the other. Um, conscious of our time, again, this is such an interesting uh, conversation, uh, but I just do want to kind of bring it to the dangers you highlight, and you've, you've touched on it a few times, it's not so much that it's, you know, humane war is, like you say, it's better than non-humane war or an inhumane war. Uh, but there are more sinister dangers at play if we go down the path that we're going. And what are those? Well, so first, there's only a, a limited extent to which you can make war humane, even if war is becoming more humane, at least great power war, fewer are dying, et cetera. Um, it, 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 the law is very permissive, what you called use in bellow, um, what I called earlier in the podcast, international humanitarian mm -hmm. law, yeah. still yeah. allows states to do a lot. Um, and so, you know, some say humane war is an oxymoron. I think that's wrong because we have to see that it's becoming more humane. But basically one one problem is the residual violence but even if you take that out of the equation um you have war itself which if if i'm right that making war humane at least you know you know al allows for war to be legitimated or perpetuated more easily um then you, you've got all the all the things that war involves which is you know soldiers deaths on both sides which are again legal mm. um you have you know the 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 taxes that are paid for one reason rather than another all the damage done um and you know the kind of thoughtless you know policy um detour that we've we've discussed where you're ending up just fighting war because you're fighting war rather mm. than thinking what your best best course is. I mean, finally, and I, I this is a bit edgy, I raise it at the end of the book, like, what if it turns out that, you know, we're really doing this um, not to kill um, even those who can be legally killed, but because the war on terror has allowed with, you know, massive surveillance power and with armed drones that might strike but might not, might just kind of collect information or you know film um we're we're kind of establishing almost like a permanent security arrangement over certain peoples um like across africa across the middle east central asia and it's it's less bloody mm. um it might be psychologically damaging yeah but point is we still wouldn't want it happening to us we mm. wouldn't want domination and control, even if it's more humane, quote unquote. So mm. that's a last category of kind of 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 concerns that I, I would single out. So, you know, violence, which it continues, war itself, which involves a lot of 
you know, um, a lot of things besides violence. And then this new thing, which is nonviolent control. Mm. Um, and all three of those seem to me sinister and worth calling out because, and, you know, worrying that humanization kind of is distracting us from focusing on them. Mm. And we also know, I mean, that what surveillance and observation does to human behavior, we know that it shapes right. and changes behavior. Um, Correct. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's at, a really important point. Yeah, because that's, I mean, if, if, if just the sheer knowledge that there might be a drone above your head, uh, right. You know, even if you're not a sinister actor, if you're merely wanting to hold a wedding, uh, you know, that will that will shape how you behave, which is correct d- dangerous in itself, of course. And even if it doesn't, I mean, I so I start out the book mm. with this kind of parable I made yeah. up of a wedding happening in, you know, Melbourne yeah, versus exactly. one happening and, mm. you know, somewhere under the drones. And, you know, th- they might be glad the guests at the wedding under the drones that they're not struck um but they're still subject to this kind of perpetual um rule in effect and we wouldn't tolerate it and the question is why we would impose it on others when security doesn't require it Uh, so i think you're making a really good point yeah and i think this is the, the the danger of the you know free west or of our comfort lives because we we often forget the impact, and again, this is something I try to infuse into my podcast, is the perspective of those not who are sinister, but those who are innocent, who are part of yes. this very war, this very just war that we're prosecuting. Yes. Um, you know, I've, I've spent uh, eight months after during a, a break from the military. I spent eight months in Iraq working in, in development in the development industry, and and mm-hmm. my eyes were open to you know the, the 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 distance from those who want to do good. Uh, in the development yes. industry to, you know, how yes. they're shaping and influencing the lives of those who are, who have already suffered, you know, in yes. some cases, decades of violence. Uh, but we just forget them. Because we forget them very quickly. Um, and if we just think fear, what fear does, even to us now with COVID, <laughs> how right. that's shaping our anxieties and anxieties going through the roof by, you know, having to stay locked up in our houses, watching Netflix and ordering Uber Eats. Now, now move that on to, the reality of a not having food, not having water, and then of course the potential of some missile dropping on your roof and wiping out your family. Um, I mean, yeah. these are, these are yeah. things that we don't account for when we talk about war or precise war, uh, humane war, etc. Uh, but maybe I'm just completely a, with you. Yeah, yeah, it's probably coming across how passionately supportive of your <laughs> of your book I am. But I think it just spoke. Uh, I've got an article coming out that's been published, I think, tomorrow, uh, the touches on this point of, uh, you know, uh, Yusin Bello and how we've, you know, the illusion of Yusin Bello, but we're, you know, letting our leaders off scot-free without questioning the, you know, Perfect. actual reason to go to war. Um, so Perfect. it's it's a very, very timely for me. Um, but maybe because you, you the book does chart a path through the US presidents. Um, and, you know, the book was really recent. So you do mention on Biden's election and Biden being in power. But uh, what is right. your assessment assessment so far on Biden's intent? I mean, are we are we likely to see the same sort of trajectory? Or I mean, of course, there's a pivot now from, uh, you know, the Middle East, broadly speaking. Um, and right. of course, you know, the, the disaster of Afghanistan to the much bigger piece of uh, competition and contestation with China. How do you exactly. see this playing out and where, where are we at the moment? Well, I think it's mixed. So, I mean, you know, the truth is that um, American presidents began pivoting away from this first big, brutal form of the war on terror almost immediately. Um, you know, Bush began drawing down troops uh, in Afghanistan before Obama came to office and tried this surge. Um, and both of them, you know, ultimately drew down troops. Uh, Obama, you know, almost got to zero in Afghanistan. I think he left it at about 7,000 after having surged to 100,000. So from that perspective, Trump, you know, in, in, in a struggling to get it to zero was just completing the job of his predecessors. And because he wasn't allowed to do so, Obama did it for him. Um, sorry, uh, Biden yeah, but, did it for yeah, him, yeah, yeah. but, you know, at the same time, um, 
you know, this whole new form of the war on terror came online and Biden promised to continue it in the speeches he gave supporting the Afghan withdrawal. He said, but I'm preserving counterterrorist operations. Now, the drone war in particular has been under review and it sounds like there may be some, you know, modifications made to it. But as you say, you know, the prime justification for U.S. foreign policy these days, not just in the war realm is this pivot to confrontation with china and if america starts a new cold war we know where that leads and mm-hmm. on the base of the old one you know kind of you know might not lead anytime soon to direct military confrontation but it could lead to a lot of peripheral war mm-hmm. and of course that will uh, uh, undoubtedly um take the form of kind of you know shadow wars mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, the humanization of war that's been accomplished in the past few decades is it's not entrenched forever, but it's a big phenomenon that will be hard to undo Mm. um, because American elites, Australian elites, so forth, care about it. Um, If there's ever an existential conflict with China, you know, all bets will be off. Um, But there may not be. There may just be kind of lesser wars. And there, I think we have to ask, you know, is the humanization of war playing this insidious role it did in the war on terror of distracting us from case to case? Hmm. Should we be fighting at all? Yeah. Um, is there a more conciliatory diplomatic route to, you know, peace that we ought to pursue instead? Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah huge question and hopefully one that's uh, echoing. Uh, I've certainly touched on that very question with even some regional experts on Southeast Asia uh, recently, right. uh, because we do. And again, this 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 morality that's infused in our own decision making makes this a very very dangerous Correct. path. Uh, but Correct. I really do hope. Uh, yeah, I do hope that. Uh, and Australia will be deeply involved in war making in the South China Sea or wherever else. Um, hmm. I mean, be, just but in, in on grounds of proximity. So it's yeah. really important to think about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sam, it's been absolutely fascinating. I, 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 again, can't stress enough how important I think your book is. Uh, so thank you very much for writing it. But I just want to throw across to you because th- there are so many threads that I'm not sure if we've caught all of them. Uh, I just want to throw across to you if you've got any closing remarks or any points that uh, you want to make before we close up that I might have m- missed to ask. Not at um, all. It was comprehensive, honestly, and a great privilege because uh, y- you're asking you know, the right question is not just of me, but in is in general. And it's really exciting that, you know, this podcast exists. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Sam. I know, I know it's coming Thank up you. to uh, the evening for you. So I hope you go and have a great night and uh, right. I hope to speak again in the future. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Voices of War. You can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And while you're there, please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com.